good morning, everyone. Welcome to the roundtable organized by the Renewable Heating and Cooling Platform and the European Heat Pump Association jointly. My name is Elisabetta. I am EU Project Officer at the European Heat Pump Association, and I will moderate the webinar today. Let's start with a brief presentation of the agenda. I will start with some logistical aspects and the introduction to the European Technology and Innovation Platform. Then I will leave the floor to our speakers and at the end of their intervention, there will be a panel discussions with some Q&A and a conclusion. Starting from the logistical aspects, don't hesitate to send us the questions you might have on the chat here or on the Q&A section and please tag the speaker you would like to answer. I remember you that this webinar is recorded and it will be soon available on EHPA YouTube channel and the slide as well will be available to all participants. Today's webinar is focused on the Spanish perspectives on the renewable heating and cooling market and it's part of the roundtable organized by the platform. These roundtables are focusing on information about particular countries such as Italy, Germany, France, in this case Spain, but also Sweden, Slovakia, Netherlands, etc. And the goal of this project is to have a roundtable for as many much countries from the European Union as possible. And of course, stay tuned to the website because there are many such roundtables that are coming up organized by other partners in the project. Uh, if you're curious to know who these partners are, here's an overview of uh, all our partners. So we have Eureka, which is the coordinator of the project. There's the EHPA, so us, of course, but also other representatives from other sectors of, uh, um, of the renewable heating and cooling. We have EJAC Geothermal, Solar Heat Europe, Aero Heat and Power, and WIP Renewable Energies. So, um, if you're interested in a specific countries and the event already took place, I invite you to check the EHPA YouTube channel as well as uh, the YouTube channel of the other partners in this project in which you can find the recording of the past roundtables. If you have questions related to the to this project funded by the European Union, please uh, don't hesitate to send us an email to this one below each slide. It is the official address that you can also find on the platform. So with that being said, just a quick summary of the RHC platform and of the goal that we have. So what is this platform? First of all, you can scan the QR code below the slide uh, with your mobile phone and you'll be redirected to the platform directly. It's a European technology and innovation platform since 2016, and its purpose is to bring together stakeholders from the biomass, district heating and cooling, geothermal, solar thermal and heat pump sectors to define a common strategy for increasing the use of renewable energies for heating and cooling. This also means showcasing that renewable energy technologies for heating and cooling are safe, clean, efficient and increasingly cost competitive. As a result of these factors, society will benefit from the increasing contribution of renewable heating and cooling to the European Union, combining improved and new technologies, innovation and development, as well as policy, funding and pilot projects. But what are the goals? So here you can see in this slide that there are several of them. First of all, develop working relationships with other relevant national and regional platforms, so other ATIPs. Establish and update strategic research and innovation agendas per technology areas from basic research to market uptake, identifying priority in the short, medium and long term but also identify priorities of cross-cutting nature, such as education and training, socioeconomic suspect, international cooperation, then identify innovation barriers, notably those related to regulation and financing, and in the end, report on the implementation of research and innovation activities at European, national and industrial level. 
Moreover, something that might be interesting to you is the RHC project database. This is a database managed by us, EHPA, and it's freely available on the RHC website. And you can see then later in the next slide how it looks like. So its objective is to track the past and ongoing project in the area of renewable heating and cooling with a focus, of course, on the one funded at EU level. So here again, you have a QR code and you can, um, and you can scan it and you will be redirected to the platform directly. Uh, here in this next slide, you can see uh, how the database looks like. So uh, if you already know the name of the project, you can search it here, uh, but also you can filter it. And uh, once you filter here, you have the project and you click on the project that you have all the information of, of them. So the purpose is to create synergies between different projects uh, with different sectors um, that, that are based on. So I already spoke too much for now, and uh, um, so I, I'm receiving some chat uh, message that people are, can't see their presentation now. Um, just a quick verification. Are you able to see them all? Yes, OK. Um, so it is now night time to um, to go to the panel discussion with uh, our speakers. The first speaker that I present you today is Marta San Roman. She is Director Gen General of AFEC, the Association of Heat Pumps and HVAC Equipment Manufacturers in Spain. And she can develop there her passion for sustainability and energy efficiency for comfort, indoor air quality and environmental health in a sustainable and decarbonized society. She has a bachelor's in physics and over 30 years of international experience in marketing strategy, innovation, product management, communications, sales and business development in major and emerging markets for diverse industry and organizations. Today, Marta will tell us about market conditions for Spain. Thank you, Marta, for being here. The floor is yours. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. Um, and um, while rereading the quote I sent in advance to this webinar, I read, because I couldn't remember, heat pumps technology shows the highest more for less in Spain with proven records of reliable and good performance of heating below minus 10 degrees and cooling above plus 40 degrees. And that brings me to something Elisabeth has just said. Uh, about renewables. They are safe, clean, efficient, and increasingly cost effect effective. That is really more for less for this technology. But let's remember that heat pumps also deliver more than one function. They deliver heating, but also cooling, and also uh, domestic hot water, or even vapor for industry. And they uh, help with the different objectives from the EU. So it is really more for, um, more for less. So uh, with regard to the um, market conditions in Spain, uh, next, can I, may I? Uh, okay, yes, thank you. Um, I'll start first with the status of renewables in Spain. According to a recent study from Ernst and Young, Spain is the eighth country in the world with the highest investment attractiveness in renewable energies. It is very strong in renewables like um, wind power. It is very strong with renewables like sun power and heat pumps is still um, in an early stage for the contribution to renewables, but it is there already. Next one, please. So for heating and domestic hot water and uh, refrigeration is not included here, we still have a major source from gas. 43% and oil, 22%, biomass is 18%, and electricity, which stands mainly for heat pumps, is 14%. Uh, it is increasing. And then we have uh, solar thermal and uh, just a little bit left uh, from carbon. This is from 2021. And 
the renewable contribution from heat pumps in Spain is growing rapidly, again, still at the early stages, uh, but in 22 versus 21, it grew plus 30%. I don't dare to provide here with the net sum of uh, um, uh, power provided in renewables from heat pumps because the current methodology for calculation used by, uh, by the government is lacking some updates and neither domestic hot water nor refrigeration are included here. Next one. So with regard um, of the contribution to carbon emissions, um, talking about Spain, the residential heating uh, stands for 5% in Spain. It is not the worst country in, the, uh, in Europe, as you can see, because there are other countries with uh, reds and dark reds. Those are the, uh, the ones who, who need to speed up on the adoption of renewable energy. Uh, but there are quite a few which are leading the path uh, and the way towards uh, renewable energies, which are the green ones. So Spain is in the, okay, uh, improvable stage, but still uh, not too bad 5%. So in the next one, just a brief introduction to AFEC. AFEC is an association for HVAC. So we have 86, uh, 87 sorry, members who are manufacturers of equipment or components in the uh, whole supply chain for um, heating, cooling, hot water, but also ventilation, components, um, regulation and control, diffusion of air, and indoor air quality, etc. And we have some honor members, among others, test laboratories or uh, some of the big utilities, which are a good partner uh, for us on the way to um, deployment of heat pumps. Next one. So the HVAC sector in Spain accounts for around 13,500 employees, a total of 2,000 million euros. Um, and it is a domestic market of 80% and 20% for export. If we go to the next slide, the first part of the table upwards, and uh, it is air conditioning, heat pumps, and domestic hot water devices, and in the different sectors, residential, commercial, and industrial. I don't want to go uh, very specifically, uh, specifically through the numbers. And all these figures are available in our website, in our market report. But just to let you know that uh, residential contributes contributes for the for the most part of the market, then commercial, then industrial. And the nice figure here is the growth in this pack of products of 24% 22 versus 21. As you can see in the table below, the contribution of ventilation, air technologies, etc., is much lower. It's still growing, but it's a lower market. Um, if we go to, well, maybe not the next slide, we are going to skip it. So that one. So what is happening in Spain? What is the regulatory context? The regulatory context is, of course, related to what's going on in Europe, and that affects all countries, but also some specific regulatory framework for Spain. So we have the CAES. The CAES are the white certificates. The white certificates are the ones that um, account for the energy savings of several um, uh, different installations. It can be in industry, it can be in tertiary market, or it can, it can be in residential. This way of financing savings has started this year. Um, it is well known in other countries like France, but for Spain it's new. And it will help certainly to promote the use of renewable energy efficiency um, installations. We also have the regulation for thermal installations and safety, and it is um, an industry law. And it really has to do a lot with how we use equipment and what kind of products we have inside. This is related, for example, to refrigerants and the projection of them. We have um, European subsidies and funding and uh, the need to comply with taxonomy. With regard to refrigerants, 
from the European um, side, we have the FGAS, but we also have a Spanish tax, which is really unique in Europe, and it is also affecting the way that uh, the market is developing and the way that we take uh, decisions. And then we have the common um, regulatory framework for Europe that is affecting all, all countries like the EPVD, like the Energy Efficiency Directive, like the uh, Renewable Energy Directive and the Energy Taxation Directive and many others. If we move to the next one, uh, I'd like to just point out the challenge we have in Spain for the development of the renewable um, technology for heating. And that is the skill, the lack of a skilled force uh, workforce. So it, it is affected not only heat pumps, but also uh, somehow, for example, PV. Um, we have a lack of generational replacement because young people is more interested in other arts. We have a negative per perception of, the of these professionals. Um, there is intrusiveness and unfair competition. Um, there is a need of education adaptation because there are many skills needed. For example, if you want to install a boiler, you just need something about plumbing and, of course, about the equipment. But if you want to install a heat pump, the knowledge from the plumbing side is not enough. You also need hydraulic knowledge. You also need electricity, electrical knowledge because the power you need for uh, activating a um, uh, heat pump is going to be different from a boiler. You need some regulatory uh, knowledge. You also need digital skills. Um, you need a refrigeration certification, et cetera, et cetera. So we, uh, we know there are movements to try to bring skill force from country to country, but it is not that easy because the regulatory issues and the language makes it a little more difficult. Um, so we are working on, on, on removing all these barriers, which I guess are common for other countries and not only Spain. If we move forward, the next one, we are going to talk about the importance of the industrial print. We are here lately, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, industry, industry, industry. I think we all have faced the uh, difficulties that the reliance on our industry on raw materials or components from other regions have brought. So we suffered a supply chain crisis in 2022. We now understand that we need to be independent as much as possible from energy and from sourcing of components. And uh, there are strong moves to invest in, in social development, but also in industrial development. We need to make um, a strong industrial print that relies only on ourselves or as much as possible. If we go to the next this one, uh, there are um, quite a big number of companies working on heat pumps in Spain. There are seven factories of heat pumps and quite a lot more on components. And uh, for the last couple of years, there has been uh, over 130 millions in uh, different um, issues for all those factories. And there are plans of like triple that quantity in the upcoming couple of years. Um, if we go to the next one, this is a slide from a study run by Cambridge Econometrics and EHPA. And they um, focus on what the benefits would be of a fast heat pumps rollout in Europe, and they made a specific exercise for a few countries, amongst others, um, Spain. So it is said that if we would um, roll out the installation of heat pumps as planned or as needed in this, um, let's say, best case scenario, we would achieve, for example, 2.3% higher GDP we would have high, uh, a larger um, income available for the households, like 3%, 250,000 more jobs created, uh, gas demand would fall in 36%, the heat pumps would be an average 50% lower than boilers along the life cycle, 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because it also brings uh, benefits regarding reduction of both CO2 emissions and NOx, which is uh, very detrimental for health. If we move to the next one, um, I want to highlight here, because this is something we feel very proud of, and I want to uh, talk off a little bit about it. Um, we are trying to push this deployment, which would bring so many benefits for our society from effect. So we started eight years ago um, a promotion plan. This promotion plan has their own um, website, which is Bomba de Calor, the, the uh, wording in Spanish, uh, .org, and 30 companies among the uh, members from AFEC are subsidizing this campaign. Um, we are working, if you go to the next one, we are working in promoting the technology at users level because there is a still a very uh, high lack of information. We are promoting training. It is not that we provide training ourselves, but we support other bodies providing training, including the administration. Uh, we are trying to fight um, some of the largest barriers in terms of uh, bursting the myths like it does not work in climates, it is too expensive, it is not possible to use here and here. So we are trying to put all these things together in a cocktail uh, vase and, and bring it in a, a nice and easy to drink uh, cocktail for everybody. And the next one, um, we just um, try to bring this as a support to legislators and remove trade barriers, not only Spanish level, we collaborate very, very uh, close with EHPA, for example, to bring the Spanish voice to the European legislators. The climate in Spain makes it very diff different. And the Spanish market has a lot of air to air heat pumps that are not that common in other countries and that face specific barriers um, for which we try to work against and try to bring them on the table of discussions. Um, we also promote forum where we can um, discuss all these items. We have supported the HBA, for example, in um, Spirec, which was the um, international renewable forum conference, and it was held in Madrid early this year. We translate documents like the um, um, heat pump accelerator, but we also try to boost between um, an interface between uh, the government and the regions, go regional governments, which sometimes are also a difficult barrier, and uh, the professionals and users to go through all these uh, specified um, uh, white certificates, the subsidies, taxonomy, and uh, the different phases of the uh, heat pump deployment. If we move to the next one, um, and it is, uh, we are reaching almost the end already, and this um, website, bombadecalor.org, you can find a um, relatively thick book on technology, but we have just launched, uh, together with the Ministry of Energy Transition, and, and that was launched just last week, um, a new guide, it is almost 400 pages on heat pumps on renovation for buildings. It is mainly focused on residential and tertiary and commercial, and it is really a good guide with best practices, real cases, some economical considerations, uh, because renovation of buildings is really the big challenge we have for this deployment of the heat pumps. The next one, um, just a couple of pictures of how we try to also bring other voices into this cocktail vase. Uh, so Endesa and Iberdrola are two of the largest utility companies in Spain. So we have promoted two different forums. One was uh, on industrial, um, uh, on B2B business, and the other, this year, the other one was focused on the industrial footprint, but uh, it can also be focused, for example, on training. And that brings our voice much farther. And uh, the last one, I just wanted to to list a few challenges that we all need to um, sort out in Spain. Um, one is the, the planning of electricity grid extension and investments. That is why we need to be close to those working on the electricity market. 
The uh, heat pump accelerator is a very nice document and it really sets all the current challenges we have and proposes means to solve them. So I think it is uh, not only affects tasks, but everybody tasks uh, to bring it um, towards and, and move forward. We need to speed up permits. Uh, it is one of the major issues we have. I am not sure how it is running in other countries, but for example, um, articulating these subsidies and the funds or having permits for the execution of the um, of these subsidies, it's taking too long, sometimes over one year. So once you have the agreement to work on a renovation actuation, then um, 15 months later, uh, the costs are not the same, the neighbors are discouraged, and, and it is not really helping. Financial support. Um, with subsidies and these white certificates, we are in the good uh, track, but again, this needs to be agile and make things easy to the professionals and the users involved in the process. Rescaling and upscaling of uh, our not only installers but also technicians. There are some cultural issues. We are still trying to compare costs of traditional fossil fuel based uh, heaters to heat pumps and only introducing in the, in the equation the capex and not the opex. This is a serious cultural issue that we need to solve. And of course, the challenge of refrigeration and heat recovery, because yes, Spain is different. We have a lot of sun, we can make a good use of it, uh, but the refrigeration needs would really bring great opportunities on, of heat recovery. And that's it from my side. I want to thank uh, RHC and EHPA and Elisabetta the opportunity to talk to you all. And uh, I leave the floor to the rest of the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much for your intervention. Very interesting. Um, and I want to remind all the participants to don't hesitate to ask questions in the chat or in the Q&A section. Uh, moving to the second speaker, um, Enrique Villamichana. He is Managing Director at Panasonic Heating, Ventilation and Air Conditioning Europe and member of the Board of Panasonic Appliances Europe. He has more than 25 years of experience in the heating and cooling industry and he joined Panasonic as the Air Conditioning Business Unit Director in 1997. Not only had the chance to work on air conditioning, but also on heat pumps and air to water solutions, leading the, op the, the opening of the first Panasonic heat pump factory in Czech Republic. Today, Enrique will tell us about heat pump manufacturing capacity and expansion. Is the market ready? Thank you for being here, Enrique, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elisabeth, and, and, uh, and thank you very much, Marta, for this uh, nice overview you have given us about, about Spain. And uh, to start the, the presentation, in fact, uh, if, we, if we look behind, when, uh, when I was requested to make this presentation, the title of the presentation was different. So, in fact, that time we said, are the manufacturers ready for the market? So, that was uh, one situation, and now, uh, the question is changing slightly, and in fact, what we say is, is the market ready for the manufacturers? Because uh, definitely the frame and uh, in the general Europe is changing quite rapidly and uh, might be also happening the same situation uh, in Spain. So if we if we move next, then, and then I, I would like to set a little the context, eh? why we are seeing uh, the situation we see. And first of all, yeah, we, we all know Europe wants to be the first carbon neutral uh, continent by 2050. So we needed to make a 55% reduction by 2030. Why so? Because, and, and I think it's important to keep reminding, so we want to fight, we want to address the climate change, because we want to secure a sustainable future, which is including economy, uh, social and environmental aspects. And heat pump is a definitely uh, is playing a, a central role uh, in, in this process, that, that is clear. 
And I have to uh, and I have to keep reminding, and I think this is important because uh, using a heat pump is definitely supporting in reducing the emissions much more than it could ever a boiler do it. So that is uh, really important, up to eighty percent. So. And then uh, we had an additional uh, factor coming to the market. So we have the, we had the, unfortunately, uh, we faced the Ukrainian war and that uh, brought to Europe the repower plan. So that, at that time, we wanted to get uh, 30 million heat pumps by 2030. At that time, what we said is 30 million is not enough. So we, we need to reach 60 million. So th that is the number we should be all looking at. And I have to say, and very rapidly, and, and we will touch upon that point later on. So I think the manufacturers, we started to, to work very hard on that. And, and I think uh, big investments have been uh, happening in Europe. For instance, in the case of Panasonic, we decided to invest. We made a decision of uh, more than 500 million uh, investment and uh, concretely 150 million to build a factory that will give us the opportunity to create up to uh, 500,000 uh, heat pumps a year. So, but if we look, and uh, I'm not still talking about Spain, but if we look at the European frame, so looks like this image is not so clear anymore in 2023, and it might be even worse in 2024. Now let's look at the Spanish case. So in fact, it is very similar as it cannot be in any other way. So Spain uh, clearly set a direction to reach carbon neutrality using renewable energy. It, it does not matter if we talk about biomass, heat pump, hydrogen, you know, and of course, uh, solar power. And as Marta has uh, just explained, the market has been growing quite a lot. So we could see, uh, as you, Marta, said, 30% in 2022. And, and still, we can see a 2023 uh, going up, even if we can see that in the last quarters, this speed is clearly uh, awakening. But the reality is still 8.5 billion million boilers are sitting in the market. So still, if we look at what we actually have in the market, uh, Spain is still a, a boiler. And yeah, I think uh, it's again, we don't need to explain transitioning to heat pump is definitely will support Spain in many senses. Also, you, Marta, said so enhancing production, enhancing services, of course, giving, giving us energy uh, safety. Uh, if we depend on our renewables, I think it's a, a, a really a critical part for our country. Will give us security, and even more, it will it will give us money as we will do, uh, as we will won't have to import so much. On the other hand, in this frame that should be uh, that interesting for Spain, what we see is that even there are several uh, subsidy uh, plans. I I think we we might agree that the Spanish market is still moving on individual initiative. So subsidy or regulation is not supporting so much the Spanish market movement. The subsidies, uh, I would say, with best intention, is still complex, not re not really reaching the not really reaching the consumers. And as I think Marta, you also mentioned again, the relation between electricity and gas is not making the return on investment so clear. But uh, you said uh, Spain is different. And in fact, Spain is, I would say, a great place for heat pump because our temperature will probably give one of the best uh, heat pump performances. That, that is clear. Uh, we have a lot of air to air. Uh, I was reading the subsidy uh, program last week, and it's very clearly explained we subsidy heat pump, but not air to air. Th that is maybe a, a point to fix is that most of the population in Spain is having an air-to-air -air heat pump. So probably we need to look. We can save a lot in using it as cooling as well. Uh, next, please. But then uh, I think the, the question is, uh, can we really sell 
60 million heat pumps in 2030. And I go back to, to the point. Uh, in fact, uh, the manufacturers probably are ready. So in fact, uh, if we, if you count, I think EPA has been explaining about that in, in many posts in LinkedIn and many places. So in fact, uh, 4 billion euro that we know are being invested in euro to produce and prepare for the number because uh, now if we put and we start counting all the investments and all the announcement the manufacturers have made, we have the capacity to produce 10 million units a year. 10 million units a year is a huge quantity. And there I'm not considering many of the OEM. So we are considering uh, publicly announced investments. So mm, the market is receiving a lot of products, but the market, on the other hand, and again, I think the Spanish case is slightly special, uh, yet uh, the market is slowing down and as it was reported in the last uh, report. Then I think the question, and, and we Panasonic, we look at that uh, very carefully because we have invested, as we explained, uh, quite a big amount of money to create heat pumps for residential or commercial factories. We have created three factories, R&D centers, etc. But the situation has changed. Then I think the question for all of us is, uh, because at the end this is the market, how can we secure all those investments are future proof. And I would say even more, how we can secure that Europe will be able to deliver the targets that we have set to ourselves. If you move to, to the next, and then I, I go uh, to, I think, to a, an important factor. Always, when we talk about uh, delivering product to the market, we are looking at the manufacturer. But I, I think we need to think in, in two ways. One point is that the manufacturer must have the ability to place a product in the market. But that is not only totally depending on the final producer. To, to create a product, we need to align many things. For instance, that you are receiving heat exchangers, that you are receiving tanks, that you are receiving electronic components. So it's a complete industry that, that need to make the investment. Also, it's very important where you will produce the goods because it does not matter if you have a great product. If, uh, for instance, we have the problem we had uh, two or three years ago where the Suez Channel suddenly stops. So even if you have products, you cannot bring the products to the market. So we need to consider the value, all the value chain from the component to the production place and the way to bring the goods to, to the market. That is one way to look at that. And the second point, uh, again, sorry, Marta, to use your name so many times, but you explain. Once the product is made, it does not matter if you can produce 10 million, 10 million products. If you don't have the ability to bring the products to the consumers, then that is not working. So my point is uh, more about manufacturing. We need to talk about the complete value chain and how to make a good value chain. So uh, yeah, I think it's the dream of all management. I, uh, we want to have predictable markets. So we want to know that the next year, the market will be 100,000 units, if possible by model. And if possible, by capacity, that would be a, a fantastic, a fantastic exercise. But of course, difficult. But I think we need to do things to make the markets predictable in a way that we can all the value chain can bring the goods to the consumer. We need uh, we need to have predictable policies. Today, in general, the policies are not predictable. Not only regulation, but also subsidies. We need to have a stable prices for gas and electricity. And not only that, where the balance is fair, because if we try to bring renewables to the market, the consumer must perceive that there is a return on the investment. That is not happening today in most of the European markets. 
And we need to make quick decisions, for instance, in regulation like uh, FGAS or PFAS, because the manufacturer, the component, even the installer, we also need to develop the right products. We need to be trained to install those products. We need to develop the component. So we cannot have the a slow decision a process we are having today when it comes to so critical laws impacting in the market development. Uh, of course, yeah, if we once we are requesting also we would like the economy to be stable, of course, which uh, might not be the case, might not be the case uh, happening these days. But I think uh, if we have the right policies, we can also overcome uh, situations like the economies uh, facing difficulties as might be happening today. So if all these factors align, I think we will have enough heat pumps because we don't want to have too few because then probably the customer is not happy, the price is too high. And we don't want to have uh, too many because then also the market will not be an interesting market. Probably if we have too much production in the wrong time, probably the, the return on the investment might not be also expected. And then the quality we expect from our market will not be the right one. Then uh, if you move next, uh, we know, uh, in reality, we know all what I said is very difficult. And then, if we want to have this 60 million heat pump installed in 2030, we need to rush. So we need to urgently, and that is a, a job for the total market, but we need to include all the stakeholders, to utilities, financial institutions, governments. We need to uh, come quickly and start uh, putting measures to accelerate this energy transition. So we need to give clear incentive to each stakeholder. We need to give clear information to the consumers and clear direction. And when I say direction is not talking, is setting rules that give clear direction to the consumer that this is the way to go. For instance, banning fossil fuel systems. So, the, so what we can see today in Europe is this uh, original ban of fossil fuel now is delaying one country after another. So those signs need to be given very clear. The consumers need to get information. They are not well informed and they need to become experts. They need to know about why, why we do it and what to do. So maybe we also need to be creative altogether because we need to give the opportunity to the consumers to make the change. So maybe those financial tools we need. Maybe we need to support them on the capex. So very difficult to pay 15,000 euros for a heat pump, even more today. But maybe the customer might accept a long-term soft loan to buy the product. So we also need to consider running time. But today, if the gas is cheaper than the electricity, it's very difficult. A consumer will invest 15,000 euro to pay more in the monthly invoice. So we need to make a fair balance between gas and electricity. We need to probably have a special tariffs or a special taxonomy for electricity. Because if the customer is happy when they buy the heat pump, understand well, and if the customer see the benefit of having a heat pump at home, we will have the greatest promoter you can have to expand the market, which is the consumer. A happy consumer will be the best weapon we will have to expand this market. And uh, again, uh, considering the value chain, so we need to work on transforming the boiler capacity. Remember, I said 8.5 million sitting in the market today. So how to transform this fantastic power into capacity to install a heat pump? And even more, we need to work on making this business very attractive to the young people. We need to train the people. For instance, we, Panasonic, we have decided to invest uh, quite a lot in training centers. And we are setting continuously training centers in Europe that will allow to educate people, to educate young people, to educate the installers, and to bring this manufacturing uh, capacity 
able to be deployed in the market with enough installation capacity. If we move uh, next, we need to go beyond manufacturing capacity. So we, I want to insist, we need to go to the complete value chain. We need well-educated consumers. We need good financing tools. We need a good balance between energy sources. We need a strong grid, able to sustain the deployment of 60 million heat pumps. When we talk about 60 million heat pumps, a big part of those millions will come to Spain. And in fact, in Spain, we are lucky because uh, in Spain, our position is relatively good because of the air conditioning history. As we said, Spain is different. Spain has been deploying a lot of heat pumps, name air conditioning in the last years. And probably we are well positioned for the first stage, but we need to be sure that the development of the grid will continue to sustain those many millions that are to come. So in any case, grid is a, definitely a, a very critical factor to, to expand the, the, the installation capacity. Moving next, and that with that, uh, uh, I will be uh, concluding. So I have to say, Europe, Spain direction is very clear. So we want to do it. But our actions are not consistent. So we need to be sure what we say is what we do. So we need to be sure that we have a degree of consistency across all the countries. So we need to be sure we work on lower taxes for electricity. Again, we need to be sure we have lower taxes for heat pumps. <coughs> so that we don't ask different testing requirements in every country, that we put the right financing tools in place, not only for the consumers, but only for the investors as well, that we support installers to adopt heat pumps. Because if not, this repower EU that was so a strong message for all the European community will be only a memory for all of us. So we need to be sure that we put all those implementation, uh, those tools to implement the, the process in place. Uh, next. So, and to conclude, uh, I think, and, and that depends very much on us. So we need to keep working very hard. So we manufacturers are definitely ready for that. I think everybody wants to do it. Europe cannot lose this opportunity. And I think if we make a good work all together, we will be able to lead this uh, global heat pump implementation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, Enrique, very, very enriching uh, your, your intervention too. Um, moving to the next uh, speaker, Jose Luis Corrales Chiganda, a senior researcher in the group of efficient thermal energy systems in Technalia Research and Innovation since 2021. He has been working for more than 10 years as a scientific assistant at Technische Universität in Berlin, mainly in the areas of simulation, development and control of sorption heat pumps, combined heat and power systems and energy efficiency. His main field of interest at the moment is the development of efficient heat pumps for domestic and industrial heating and cooling and the heat recovery and upgrade of low temperature waste heat. Today, Jose Luis will tell us about innovative approaches in to increase the penetration of renewable heating and cooling in Spain using heat pumps. Thank you for being here. Jose Luis, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you for the introduction, Elisabetta. And I'm going to present today some approaches on how to use uh, heat pumps in an innovative way to overcome some barriers that have been presented before. So I work at Technalia Systems instead, and we work on efficient thermal systems. So one of our main uh, focus of work is heat pumps in both uh, residential and Today I'm going to show some approaches we are following for, for the residential sector. Thank you. Next slide. Please. So for the motivation, uh, I have here some slides that compare the evolution of the primary energy consumption for, for
for the residential sector. And that was, has been presented before also by Mrs. Roman. And you can see that heating and domestic cold water preparation still accounts for a large amount of the energy we use in our homes. And even in 2020, uh, we have the largest amount of energy is used in Spain for heating. Uh, next slide, please. So I have some numbers that compare the structure of uh, energy consumption in residential homes in Spain, 2014, 2020. And as you can see, it has changed a little bit, but not really that much. Uh, it was dominated by natural gas in 2014, and it is still dominated by uh, natural gas 2020. 2021, Mrs. San Roman presented electricity consumption increase to 14%. Here is 8%, mainly because of the heat pumps, but still most of the primary energy use is natural gas for heating and also for domestic hot water. And interesting is also that, as you can see, the, the share of solar energy, that is the yellow, in the, is only visible for domestic hot water preparation and has not really significantly changed. So that's something I hope it will uh, increase, but there is a presentation about it later. But now we want to show how can we improve the renewable heating and cooling that we, uh, that we can, how can we increase the electricity consumption for this uh, heating and domestic hot water preparation. Next slide, please. So uh, for this motivation, I, I show you this because I think for Spain it's quite interesting to show that there are different so-called climatic zones where you have different conditions. So in the Atlantic North, that is uh, in the northern part of Spain, you have mostly heating and you don't have much need of cooling. In the continental uh, climatic zone in yellow, you have mostly heating and cooling. You have both. In the summer can be quite hot and in the winter you need heating. And in the Mediterranean area that is uh, depicted in uh, orange or brown, you have mostly uh, uh, air conditioning. So this is where all these heat pumps that are air to air are installed mostly. So also in the continental zone. But there are some numbers from one study from the IDAI for 2014. But still you see that most of the heat pumps that we have are air to air, and especially in the Mediterranean area. So what we try to show is some solutions on how to, to increase the deployment of heat pumps on these three climatic areas and following different approaches. So next slide, please. So for the Mediterranean climate, as we saw before, we have mainly air-to-air -air, uh, heat pumps, but we think it is also interesting to have air-to-water heat pumps for uh, domestic hot water preparation. I will show some approach how to deal with this. For the continental climate, uh, I have an interesting uh, solution, that is heat pump source hybridization, ground source, air source. In this case, for continental climate, you need both uh, cooling and heating. And then for the Atlantic climate, it's mainly a uh, heating-dominated situation. So what you need is mostly heat pumps for heating. But the problem here is that uh, you have mainly old buildings where you need retrofitting uh, solutions. And it's difficult to use this retrofitting solution, so I will show some approach we are following at Technalia to overcome these difficulties. Next slide, please. So first for the Mediterranean climate, uh, next slide. So for the Mediterranean climate, uh, the motivation is to reduce the energy consumption for the production of domestic hot water in urban environments. That's uh, what I'm going to show is a uh, work that has been performed by colleagues of Universidad Politecnica de Valencia. And you can hear the sources if you want to read the study. So they wanted to see how can we improve the energy consumption if we use heat pumps instead of the traditional methods. The problem here for these areas is that there is no space. It's mostly a vertical buildings, four, four, five, six, eight floors. Only a small amount of uh, terrace available uh, on the top. So it's not so easy to, in existing buildings, to implement uh, 
solar heating. So and the opportunity that has been identified is to make use of the energy communities. That's uh, uh, a way of uh, producing energy that is being promoted by the European community and as well for the Spanish government at the moment. So that uh, tries to to motivate the citizens to participate in the energy transition, like uh, working in collective action. So in this case, it will be to have collective heat pumps that can provide uh, domestic hot water for for many neighbors in one building. Uh, next slide, please. So for the Mediterranean climate, uh, and the methodology will, will follow for this case is we have, uh, these colleagues have analyzed a district in Valencia called Illa Perduda. With 164 buildings, mostly residential, and built in the 60s and 70s. So this is many different topologies of buildings, but in average, with 17 dwellings, 17 uh, flats in each of these buildings, and they can compare what happens, how it affects the energy consumption if we use either the existing solutions that are one and two, either immersion electric heater with around 80 liters tank, a 1.5 kilowatt capacity, gas boilers. And this gas boiler is for the whole building, because it's 28 uh, kilowatt. And uh, then the two alternatives they have studied is first individual air source heat pumps. Uh, in each dwelling, one small uh, heat pump for domestic hot water preparation, one kilowatt using uh, uh, using propane, L290, or as alternative, using an air source heat pump for the whole building. And in this study, they have calculated and optimized the best size of the heat pump and the hot water, domestic hot water tank for each building. The methodology they have followed is uh, transit simulation. So they have modeled each the demands of each uh, domestic hot water demands for each building using the profiles produces with PHV Calc, is a, a software for producing uh, these domestic hot water uh, loads. And they have seen how much energy they can they can save by using these three pumps. So next slide, please. So these are the results of the study. And there's some comments. They have used these factors. So they have assumed that the emission factor for gas is 0 0.2 tons of CO2 uh, per megawatt of gas use, and for electricity, 0 0.112 tons of CO2 per megawatt of electricity. And the price of uh, electricity uh, is around 7 cents of euro per gas and 20 cents of euro per kilowatt hour, of course. So they have, what they have shown is that with the individual EPSOS heat pump, they have an average COP of 4.0, seasonal performance COP 3.3. So it's in Valencia, it's climate outside is not so cold, so they can have operate with good COPs. And oh, uh, working hours around 1,600. And the energy use is uh, 400 kilowatt hours. So the energy cost will be around 80 euros per year. So with this solution, they will save approximately 400 euros per year for each for each flat, for each wedding. And they have also simulate each of these optimized heat pumps. You can, you can see here for each of these buildings with the different colors. And for each building with the collective uh, uh, collective uh, air source heat pump, they can save around 2,300 euros per year. Another aspect is that if they go for this solution with collective uh, air source heat pumps, they only require 150 heat pumps, but if they want to put one heat pump at each dwelling, it will be more than 4,000. So the alternative with the, with the collective source, uh, air source heat pump will need a little bit less of capacity, but they can save a lot of uh, volume for, for the water storage, so 85%. Next slide, please. So these are the second part of the results of the study. So the average dwelling, because it depends on the dwelling. So you, as I said before, each color here is a, 
uh, it's a different house, so they, they need to compare for its dwelling. But each average dwelling is responsible for 36 kilograms uh, of CO2 per year, energy cost of 65 euros per year. So they have compared for the whole district. You can see here on the right the colors of the CO2 emissions savings for each building, and on the bottom, the cost, uh, average cost in euros per kilowatt for each building. So at the end, the table shows that either if they use individual air source heat pumps or collective air source heat pumps, they can reduce really uh, a large amount the CO2 emissions by 90%. And the, the cost, the energy cost for the whole district can be reduced also largely. So from around 2 million of euros per year to uh, 300,000 euros uh, yeah. per year. And the second lesson which they have learned is that with the collective solution, the CO2 emissions will be reduced a little bit, so they are better. But what they can really improve is the initial price of the HP component. So if they put all the neighbors together, uh, or they, there are some initiatives from the local government encouraging the population to do so, the initial cost of the capex for these heat pumps can be reduced. But each neighbor has to install a heat pump, but they can use a collective one. But the, the problem with this is that they need disagreements between the members of the community. So legal implications are not still not there really clear. But I think this is a, a, a promising solution, and that's something that should be should be followed, especially for this kind of, of buildings. So that was the first example. Please uh, next slide. The second example is for the continental climate. And here I will show uh, hybrid uh, irrigation. So this is another kind of solution. This is for new constructions. So when you are building new, uh, new structures, then you have more freedom. So in this case, you can tailor make your solution in a much better way. So the solution, the motivation is to provide with heating, cooling, and domestic hot water 90 homes. So high quality homes distributed in nine blocks. So the solution, the opportunity is to, to use uh, high efficiency standards and the latest technology. This is a project that has been uh, made by the company Geotel from Madrid using EcoForest heat pumps that are also produced in Spain. So here are the sources. So next slide, please. So the solutions they have shown is uh, quite interesting, in my opinion, is to use uh, heat pumps with a hybrid solution for the source. So they have five heat pumps with a from Eco Forest with a capacity between 25 and 100 kilowatt each. And as a source, they use four holes with a depth of 20, 125 meters for covering the base demand, so 60% of it. And with these heat pumps, they can also work with both uh, ground source or air source. They use air source heat pumps that, uh, that cover the peaks. So I think it's a quite interesting solution for buildings or for situations where you can have geothermal energy, but to optimize the cost for it, you can combine for the peaks. This air source system reduce the cost for for the ground source. And as an alternative concept, I want to show that's the so-called dual source system, a development that has been made in Ternalia by some colleagues of my group. So this is a dual source uh, heat exchanger. So it can work as an air source uh, heat exchanger, but it can also work as a connected to the ground. And that's some new developments that can decrease the investment costs for this uh, hybrid source heat pumps. And that was developed in the 3HP project. So if you want to know more about this, you can check this uh, on the internet. So next slide, please. The last solution I want to show is for the Atlantic climate, and that is uh, cascading heat pumps for retrofitting multi-family buildings. Uh, this uh, was developed in a project, a European project called Happening, uh, that is coordinated by Technalia, by our institution, and, and we have one demo case that I will show. Uh, so the motivation 
is to expand heat pumps in existing multi-apartment buildings. Uh, right now, and especially in the Atlantic area, there is almost no uh, heat pumps for multi-family buildings. So this is one approach how to make it in an efficient way. The challenges, the non-technical challenges have been mentioned before by the previous speakers. Lack of, of knowledge and training of installer, high initial cost. That is something that has to be addressed. But in this project, we want to also to attack the other non-technical barriers, the lack of information of verified performance of, of this kind of heat pumps. We want to show that it's possible to install it and that they can work with a high COP if you do it in the correct way. So the technical challenges are the high heat losses uh, in the distribution pipe, the high temperature, level requirements in the heated systems. So we want to show how, how to solve this. So next slide, please. So the solution that is followed with the happening concept is to use a cascade, so to have a central air to water heat pump at the basement of the building, where you can use the air to produce hot water at an intermediate uh, circuit or uh, temperature water loop with a not so high temperature, 20 to 30 degrees, so you can decrease the distribution losses. And then at, at each building, you can install a solution, an individual heat pump to increase the temperature up to the level that you need. And all of this uh, integrated in a system that controls the energy management system, the solar photovoltaic production, and the working of the, of the heat pump. So you can use the flexibility, use the tank to regulate and to optimize the performance of the heat pump. Next slide, please. The advantage of this system is also that uh, you can make tailor-made solutions. So you have the big heat pumps at the basement where you can have the first uh, thermal jump to 20 to 30 degrees, and then at each of the buildings, at each dwelling, you can make a lot of solutions. So in some cases, you can work with higher temperatures, in other with lower temperatures, but you can tailor make this solution. So next slide, please. So I just want to finish to show you how it has been implemented in the demo case. We have here uh, close to our, uh, to our facilities in Pasaya, near San Sebastián, and also Spain. So it's in a building uh, for social, public social housing with eight dwellings. And before, they have individual gas boilers, solar thermal that is not working anymore, and double rider radiators. So what we have implemented in this project is, next slide, please. It's a solution made of two big uh, air-to-water heat pumps with 18 kilowatts at the basement. That is from, that is from here, from the forest as well. And then the big tank of water and then the distribution with three uh, water to water heat pump with six kilowatts at each floor. And they will use the system radiator and the photovoltaic, uh, existing photovoltaic plant. So we are still uh, commissioning of the plant, but we hope that we can show that we can achieve very high service with the solution. And that's all from my side. I think the next slide is just to say thank to you. Uh, I hope they, they like it like this possible solution, but if you want to know more about this, you can write an email or look at it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jose Luis. Um, very interesting. And uh, I can already see some uh, question in the chat addressed to you that uh, will be addressed in the, um, the second part uh, of this webinar for the panel discussion. Uh, thank you very much. So um, I give now the floor to um, the next speaker, Ulage Fuertes, Group Product Manager at BDR Termia Group. He is also president at ACIT, the Spanish Solar Thermal Association, where he works to claim the important role of solar thermal energy on the decarbonization of the economy. He is senior professional in the HVAC industry with more than 20 years of experience leading complex projects on the energy transition. Today, Ulage will tell us about solar thermal perspective, opportunities, and threats. Thank you for being here, Ulage, and the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Isabetta, and thank you all the attendees for, for uh, being here. And also thank you to uh, EHPA and the Renewable Heating and Cooling Platform to invite me. So, First, if you want to go to the, next, to the first slide, uh, just a quick contradiction of ACID, okay? 
uh, as it uh, is representing uh, most of the industry in the in solar thermal in in Spain. So our aim is to um, to work to uh, deploy the, the full potential of this uh, technology mainly in Spain. And our activities mainly is the awareness. So we try to make a lot of um, uh, a lot of events and also we try to reach to uh, to the installers and to the, also to the to the public uh, governments uh, to yes to, to inform and to deploy uh, also we are trying to do some kind of, of lobby uh, to be sure that uh, we have um, equal equality uh, in all our, all our energy plans and we have fair uh, fair law fair regulations uh, for our industry. Also, we are uh, we are coordinating the, the SOPLAT platform, that is this uh, this innovating platform that try to join um, the administration, the industry, and the researchers in uh, trying to develop these R&D activities in solar thermal. Next slide, please. Okay, so talking a little bit about the technology, uh, what to say? Is I'm in love with this technology. It's a quite mature uh, technology, uh, already deployed, so we have a strong uh, capacity. Uh, it's local local capacity. So in Europe, we have uh, a lot of companies active in this market and very close uh, to uh, locally to the market. Okay, is uh, is a, a high uh, efficiency technology? So we have to consider that the solar thermal collector has an efficiency of more than 80%. Uh, also, uh, in, um, indeed, the technology itself is a storing energy. So its uh, solar system is uh, has a, uh, a tank. So this means that it has a, is giving a, a high energy density. So we can see uh, solar thermal as well as a, a thermal a thermal batteries. Uh, in my in my speech, I I'm going to talk about which are the constraints that we have for the energy transition and for sure the flexibility and the, how we can store the, the capacity is a, is a key point in this energy transition and solar thermal also is helping this. But also when we look at the, the CO2 uh, emissions, I, I can say that uh, when we are talking to produce uh, hot water, I would say it's one of the best technologies in terms of CO2 emissions. Not only by the CO2 emissions that you are avoiding, okay, if in comparison of if you have to you need a, uh, an, a, a, any heater, but also the amount of CO2 that is is very low in the production in all the production stages, and also talking about the uh, recyclability, okay, the, the thermal collectors are highly recyclable, uh, making copper, aluminium, and they are very easy to separate and to recycle. All, all in all, uh, this ends also, and is what is interesting for the for the, the customers, for the end users. Uh, this technology, when is uh, a thermal collector, has a is a long longevity. It uh, it lasts more than 25, uh, 25 years. So when we look at the operational cost of these installations across all the, the life of the installation, is very very. Good. So saying that, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is this is like I think I have seen also in in with my in my colleagues in this in the round table I have seen also similar similar slide. Um, this is how we spread the, the demand across uh, across Europe. So and we can see that 50% uh, of this demand is heat is heat demand. We have also a strong uh, need on on transport and to in an electrical existing electrical demand. Okay, so first question I put here on the table is why we have to electrify everything, and I want to explain which are the problems of electrifying everything when a 50% of the demand is hit. Okay, so maybe and it's also all the, all the the participants in this in this table today uh, are here. We can't have a, a renewable heat to cover this. this. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Making uh, one step uh, back, uh, and, and as uh, also Enrique Vilmejana has also explained very well, so uh, we are here to try to deploy this energy transition. So we have a very challenging plans from the European Union, but here the key point is the implementation. So this is the evolution of the CO2 uh, emissions uh, in Spain. 
And all of us, we know that in by 2050, we want to be uh, neutral in, in these emissions. And also, the, the strategy of the European Union is that it consists that uh, we are going to electrify all the economy, understanding that this electricity will be green electricity or will become from uh, renewable uh, sources. Uh, so the challenge is huge because you, you can see that the trend is a lot, a lot to do. But uh, so next slide, please. OK, so this is the electricity generation. And I have, I, I must say that in, in Spain, um, yes, the renewables are, are exploding. TV last year was blowing very, very fast. But uh, in, in the best case, we can say that 42% uh, uh, of the current electricity in Spain is generated by renewables. Uh, in mind, we have uh, um, uh, hydro, okay, hydrological, uh, wind, and, and solar PV, and also uh, solar thermal, as the solar thermal for electricity, but for Next slide, please. Okay, but if we go to the total demand of energy of our country, uh, the renewables just count for 8%. OK, because we have a lot of oil, we have a lot of nuclear, we have natural gas. There is a lot, a lot uh, to change to electrify uh, this. So the challenge is huge. And uh, next slide, please. Um, here I have made a, a study um, very similar of what uh, our colleague uh, in Soviet Europe, uh, Harald Druck, has done uh, in, in Germany. OK, so we have made some assumptions how we are going to transform uh, our economy to a fully electrified economy. Okay, we have in the total demand, uh, we have uh, 530 terawatts hour uh, year that in for traditional uh, electrical applications that they this will remain, okay, uh, to, to move electrical machines uh, or uh, electrical uh, uh, household appliances, etc. Then if we look to the transport, um, we need uh, to transform 370 gigawatts. Uh, we think we can reduce. There are assumptions. Okay, we can have volume, but it is just uh, an idea. We can reduce up to 171, uh, understanding that some of these uh, transport, these, some of these vehicles can be transformed uh, in, in hydrogen. But to produce this hydrogen, okay, we will require 114 gigawatts. Um, also, we will can we can have also we can move to electrical vehicles that they will uh, account. We expect 50, 57 terawatts, right. and then uh, heating and cooling. Yeah? Heating and cooling is a strong strong demand in our, in our country. So we can think that also some existing uh, gas boilers in the future. This is a, a long path uh, <laughs> uh, to run uh, yet, but we can have some appliances um, again with hydrogen. So this can account for 16 gigawatts. We have the heat pumps. Okay, this is a, a very nice uh, appliance. So it has a it's high, it has high efficiency. You are just paying electricity to move heat from one uh, source to another, and we ex can expect that we can reduce the demand from 73 to 24. And also we can have other appliances. All in all. We can think that in the near, so if we want to deploy or so we want to transform all our economy just purely electrical, we can move from 276 gigawatts to 766. This is an exponential growth on the electricity. Next slide, please. And this is just again trying to give a little bit of, of context of where we, we come, how we are developing these, uh, these renewables, but hydraulical. Uh, uh, Renewables, we can expect that it will be less in the future because it's not raining uh, so much. So difficult to grow in for hydraulics. And if this comes from wind and, um, and, uh, and PV, we can see that we need to multiply almost by, by seven the renewables. So it's a long, long path through. So can be done, okay, maybe. But here, the, the first message I give, okay, there are other renewables that can help. So if, if Instead of electrifying everything, we can think that again, 50% of the demand is heat. There are other renewables, other heating renewables like solar thermal that can help to achieve the 2050 uh, ambition. Okay, next slide. 
Yes, another reflection also the, was mentioned is, is huge is the the grid. Uh, this is okay. We are, we have the, the existing grid uh, needs to be adapted uh, to the, this uh, big amount, but also it's not the the quantity of electricity, but this kind of electricity. So when we have renewables, we need that our grid will be more prepared uh, for the flexibility, for this continuity. Um, last week I was in the set plan conference that was uh, held here in close to, to Barcelona and I was listening all the the challenges we have to adapt our grid and the, the big uh, amount of investment that is needed to and also the risk. Also, so grid will be also an issue. Also understanding that uh, currently if you have 20%, 30% of renewables injecting to the grid is one thing. But when you are start to saturate this grid, so it will be much more complex if you have to grow from 80% renewables to 100% renewables, this will be a huge. On the other side, we already in our country, we have also uh, uh, so, uh, an infrastructure on, on, a, on, on gas network. And the question is what we're going to do with this existing infrastructure. Okay, okay next one. Okay, now moving to more in detail and uh, it's also the, the aim of this uh, of this uh, table is where we have the, the demands we can see that uh, our buildings represent 40 percent of the energy this is an average in europe and you can here you can see uh, how we spread this demand but a lot in space heating and uh, for the water uh, production okay and of course also this today this uh, represents 36 percent of the greenhouse emissions. So next, please. This is a, a study that, that we did in dom for domestic for the water because this is the main demand in in, a, in a Spain or the, sorry, not not the main demand, but the, the 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 demand that can be covered better with uh, solar thermal. Of course, also with uh, new building regulations that uh, the insulation of the buildings is improving. Also the the demand of the, the space heating and the cooling demand will be reduced a lot, but not uh, the domestic cold water that will remain. Will remain reduced. So here we are comparing the different systems. Uh, we have the typical gas boiler or the gas uh, water heater. Uh, this, is, uh, this is showing uh, CO2 uh, emissions per kilowatt hour produced. And so if we are burning gas in terms of seasonal, seasonal performance factor or seasonal COP, Okay, it's not the, the best, it's 0 0.9. So in comparison, if we produce this with a, with a heat pump, uh, expected COP of, of three, we can reduce this, the, this demand and of course the, the emissions uh, by, by three, more than three. Okay, but, sorry, sorry, can, yes. Um, but I have to remind that the traditional application to produce uh, hot water, it was already uh, a hybrid system. It was irritating. It was never it was uh, mentioned like this, but was irritating a gas boiler with uh, a solar thermal system. So when we th when we think in this kind of systems where we can cover 70, 80 percent of the full demand just by free with a renewable means that is a solar thermal, and then you just cover the, the pending uh, with a gas boiler. When you calculate the efficiency in terms of COP you can see that it's much better extent. Okay, so the message is not, okay, let's maintain the gas boiler. This is this is clear. We want to get rid of the, of the gas. So also I, I have to, to admit that is, uh, the sector has done an astonishing work to transform the, the sector, moving from traditional gas applications uh, to heat pumps. And this uh, has implied all the, the value chain from the manufacturer that has to develop uh, new appliances, but the, the installer that has, has to be uh, trained and reinvented. And also for the, for the end users eh, that they, has need to be educated. Also the, the time, the use of the installations has to be changed and to be adapted. Okay, so here the question is, if the traditional heating uh, uh, appliances has this emulation of solar thermal plus gas boiler, why would we not replace the gas boiler with a heat pump? And we can end with a very high, high efficient system. Okay. And this means innovation. So domestic hot water uh, in Spain can we can achieve a system performance factors of uh, more than 35. 
Next slide, please. Okay, and here, as, uh, as yes, summarizing uh, what I said, I think hybridization is is a is a plus, or I should be. I think in terms of uh, political regulation, should be a must because I think it's quite naive thinking that uh, one technology can uh, cover by themselves uh, these energy transition uh, needs. But I think this a combination of of technologies. So. When you combine heat pumps uh, with solar thermal, um, the, the extra investment is not uh, so much. I'm talking mainly with a new building, okay? Petrofit, maybe it's more complicated, but for new building, the, the extra capex is not uh, so much because uh, you already have uh, the tank. Um, but the, the operation cost on the total life of the installation is reduced a lot because of this very high high efficiency. Also, in, when this is translated in, in CO2, also this is a massive reduction of, of CO2. And also, you enlarge the life expectancy of your uh, installation because the heat pump is running less hours and also it has, it has not to run at, at, at the maximum power during the, during the last hour. Okay, next slide. So, uh, saying that in the residential segment, uh, we see a strong uh, potential, more in Spain, that has uh, a, a lot of uh, hours of irradiation. So, just uh, in the uh, just if the government work in the building uh, existing building regulations, Código uh, Técnico de Edificación in Spain, just moving the limits of renewables. Okay, so the technology today uh, make possible that to be more ambitious. Okay, and make that not only just with a single uh, heat pump is enough, but maybe with these hybrid systems, we can go much, much faster. But of course, this needs also additional controls from the from the government uh, to check that this is done properly and these legislations are properly sized and also to guarantee that the savings that uh, they are projected uh, can be can be achieved. And also, and this also has been been said by my colleagues. Also, we need to uh, put some measures, uh, so some measures uh, to the installers. Okay, we need to educate better uh, installers. We have a uh, base installers that come from traditional plumbers installing gas boilers. Um, okay, heat pumps are much more much more complex. The size of installations is is key, and also if we want to be nice, also we need also to train these installers in other sectors. Okay, next slide, please. So I have been talking till now from the residential segment, but there is another segment that it has a, enormous potential. I would say today is not attended, almost not attended, and is uh, and is is the sector that is consuming a lot, a lot of energy is the, the industrial sector. And I'm focusing mainly in those industries that uh, has low temperature processes, uh, where uh, heat pumps and solar thermal can cope uh, very well. So these two processes like uh, boiling, pasteurizing, sterilizing, um, there are some industries that are very favorable to, to introduce uh, our technologies, like the, the beverage industry, uh, or, but also the, the pharmacy industry, chemicals, paper, uh, cork, etc. Okay, uh, recently the news has appeared that uh, Heineken uh, plan uh, has installed a huge, uh, a huge solar plant inaugurated by the, the president of Spain. So there are several examples. Uh, they are, uh, these are small yet, so we are, we are aiming to have some demonstrative projects, but the potential of growth here is, is huge. So next slide. So sizing this, uh, which is the, this potential, uh, we think that we can easily over the 50% of, of the gas demand that if you remember when we had the, the Russian war, the, 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 the Russian Ukrainian war, uh, we were aiming at the, at the beginning to reduce our gas demand. Uh, so solar thermal in the industry can help a lot on, on that. And we can multiply easily by 10 the current capacity, the current stock capacity that we have in our country. What is needed for that? We need uh, financial measures to help uh, the, the industry, the, the, the companies, uh, to make this, this step. Also, some because what we need now is to make this some 
uh, start some projects, eh? some demonstrative projects, some flagship projects that can uh, help uh, others to also to follow. Uh, also, some uh, some uh, funds. Uh, I think uh, I think that uh, funding uh, these uh, savings it will be very favorable, and also to tax the CO2 emissions. Okay. Today is is quite uh, cheap uh, to emit uh, CO2. Okay, so this is just is explained by the future generation. Um, just taxing the correctly the CO2, it will help a lot to to develop the. Okay, next slide. And just to to finish, this is my last slide. Uh, also, that there are other benefits apart uh, of the energy transition, but uh, like the energy independence. So we have seen how Europe is so fragile in terms of the dependency uh, from one side from the, the, the Russian gas, but also from the, the, the Chinese uh, technology. Solar thermal is a uh, European made uh, technology that already has the has a strong capacity already installed, so it's very quick uh, uh, to deploy. It's a source of, of jobs, uh, it's a high value jobs with all the, cha the, the value chain already uh, integrated in, in Europe and in Spain. And we already have, the, so it's, it's helping uh, to, um, to, uh, to the constraints that we have in our infrastructure. Okay, think that once we have everything electrified, also we will have peaks on our, uh, on our electricity grid. Uh, so all that we can to, to, to uh, stabilize this grid and to shave these, uh, these peaks, it's, uh, it's a good help. And, uh, and again, it's also is giving us uh, energy independence and energy security. Okay, that's all from my side and I will be happy to answer any questions there. Thank you. Thank you, Ulage. And I can see that also for you, there are uh, some questions in the chat. <laughs> um, but thank you um, again. So moving to the next speaker, uh, Javier Urchueguia is a full professor in the Department of Applied Physics of the Polytechnic University of Valencia. During his career as a researcher, he has participated in more than 80 project and research contract with the administrations, of which he has been principal investigator in 20 of them. He is author of more than 90 artic research articles in index uh, international journals and more than 150 publications in research congresses, national and international. Specifically in the area of geothermals, Javier is currently chairman of the European Geothermal Thermal panel, and he co-founded in, in 2008 the Low Enthalpia Geothermal Group of APPA, the Association of Renewable Energy Producers, and the Spanish Geothermal Platform. In 2017, he was elected vice president of the main European Association of Geothermal Enterprises, based in Brussels, and partners of the project. Uh, thank you for being here, um, Javier. Today, he will speak about uh, specificities and evolution of the heating and cooling energy sector in Spain, past and per perspectives with a focus on geothermal heat pumps. The floor is yours, and thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Elisabetta. So, yeah, I'm very happy to be here in you, EHPA. I was also a uh, very linked and connected to the RHC ETIP, which is the framework for today's uh, meeting and uh, I think this show showcases also what was the message when we started the RHC, what was is the, the huge potential of the integration and the collaboration of the different sources of thermal energy uh, in Europe. So we have seen here presentation from the heat pump associations, from ACID, from the solar thermal sector. I, I represent more closely the geothermal sector and we are uh, nowadays in this uh, in these uh, last months discussing with the Commission, with the European Commission, uh, about the possibility of deploying a geothermal strategy. So this is another sector which is also tightly connected to the uh, to the building sector and to the problematic of the decarbonization. So I want to talk from this perspective from as a geothermal sector, but also taking into account the cross-link with, with the heat pump, a question which is uh, the today's focus where there is a, a technology called shallow geothermal technology, which really is a, is a, is a cross-section, a cross-link between these two terrific technologies, such as uh, geothermal and heat pumps. So I want to show a little bit what is 
what is being done in, in Spain in terms of shallow geothermal, which is not exactly a, 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 a country with a huge de development, but with very interesting uh, inputs there. And I want to show, first of all, how this came about. A little bit more, I, I don't want to put too much examples of data because you can read this all, just a little bit more inspiring of what can be done in, the question, in, in our climate conditions, in our also geological conditions in terms of, uh, let's say, increasing this, this share of the geothermal energy. What, what this can bring about is also part, part two, let's say, what are the opportunities? And I will show some examples just uh, to see how this uh, technology can boost really and make, it much, much, make the heat pump much more efficient. But this is also linked to some barriers. Some of them has been, have been already mentioned, like, for instance, the question of the of the of the of the training of the people, which is uh, critical also for our sector. So I will I will address this in the last slides and also talk about what we should do in Spain, particularly because we have specific questions and barriers which which we we have to tackle to really uh, get this this integration, this improved integration between between the geothermal sector and the heat pump sector in Spain. So go to the next slide. I will just show you some. Some very interesting thing because this was a work in Spain in UPV, which started with a big question, which was, does it work? Does geothermal heat pump work? And uh, why why this question? This is because uh, there were no data about if or whether geothermal works in cooling dominant and cooling conditions. As you know, in Spain we have a climate which in, was shown also in the Tecnalia presentation, in which we have many regions in, we call mixed climate, and with the cooling. Uh, requirements are very strong. So uh, geothermal heat pumps were developed in, in heating dominated areas in the north of Europe. So there are, were less information about the, 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 the let's say, the, the possibilities of this technology in our climate conditions. So we started in 1998, the first old project, which was uh, with the ministry. Next slide, please. In which we already started to put something down the earth with this heat pump you can see here to to really see if if this technology is viable, is is is, is feasible in our conditions, and but if you see the next slide, I think the most interesting uh, project was in the next slide here, where we are really we are comparing what is the comparative advantage of a ground source based heat pump with a air source based heat pump. In this scheme, you can see that we put both of these in parallel. Uh, interestingly, also I would like to mention that this installation was done with propane. Uh, 290 in year 2002. So the idea was to collect throughout many years data about the comparative performance in the Valencian climate, which is heating and cooling uh, with, with this geothermal type of, of heat pump. You can see here some picture about the, the boreholes. There were six boreholes, 50 meters, and the installation in the in the in the in the upper part of the building was a conventional state-of-the-art. Uh, heat pump, uh, air source based heat pump uh, from the SEAT company. So this was a very interesting experiment because it gave us for the first time uh, real data uh, across a long period of time, next slide please, in which we could really see that there is a huge advantage of uh, if you couple the ground to a heat pump in terms of COP. You can see here uh, the COP, the SPF more precisely across a whole a season, a cold cooling season, which uh, really was 60% better if you use the ground because of the ability of the ground to somehow store the heat, which was released to the ground through the heating season. This this information was in a paper, which is one of my most cited papers, because uh, really it brought the ground to this uh, claim that uh, ground source heat pump and geothermal technology could work with heat pumps and uh, also in, in conditions where cooling is, is important. So you can read this in, in, in my, in, in, let's say you go to Google citations and you can easily download this paper. So there's much more information, but I think this graph is especially interesting in this regard. And this opened also the way in Spain, next slide please, to talk about geothermal. And there are three main messages I would like to bring up here. One is the, that just shallow geothermal technologies or the coupling, better to say, of ground to a heat pump is not only feasible, but very efficient in mixed climate conditions. So uh, why that? Because it increases the benefits of storage. We're not talking in Europe about thermal energy storage. Well, ground source heat pump is thermal energy storage uh, in a seasonal way in which you take chance of the energy released to the ground in a season 
through the other. The second main message is that the proper design is especially critical in this type of installations because here you have to ensure that you have an energy balance in the ground. That means that you release not uh, more heat to the ground that you really can be, are able to take up and uh, because otherwise you cannot ensure that these conditions is, are met throughout the years. So this is very important here. So you need a, a good design in which this balance, this heating and cooling balance in the ground is ensured. And this requires, for instance, to have a not, uh, let's say, a different view about the, the design of this type of systems, not taking too much out the capacity of the system, but actually the uh, the the amount of energy which is actually released to the to the ground. And um, as I mentioned before, this this functioning, this improved efficiency of these systems is critically linked to the idea of thermal energy storage, in such a way that. Uh, Let's say this is it's, it's really something which is uh, really closely closely interrelated. The uh, this idea of storage, this uh, hence this this heat pumps, this this ground source heat pump could uh, really uh, um, let's say give 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 an important contribution to the thermal energy storage uh, um, capacity building uh, objectives of the European Commission in these days. So if we go to the next slides. I would just. Uh, showed some early results because um, next slide the in, in Spain after, from from this year on 2005 would be a critical year. There were started to be projects. Here can we see some just three examples in the area of Valencia, and one idea that was brought to the market very early is the idea of hybridization. And here in this bigger picture, you can see a building in two thousand commission 2007 in with which was to my knowledge the first building in which a uh, Aerosols and heat and ground source heat pump, but combined together to make to give an optimum techno-economical uh, benefits to the to the to the house owners, in which uh, you could see that uh, let's say most of the of the of the base load was cap was let's say coped by the ground source heat exchanger, but the the let's say part of the capacity was air source heat pump just to uh, diminish, let's say, to, to the capex of this of this project. We have already other examples here. One very interesting one in the area of Torrentes, which we built uh, uh, what we called a heat ring, heat and cooling ring, in which you could share the heat pump and the ground source, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the ground source part uh, with several small buildings in which this balance of heating and cooling was maintained throughout these loop systems. So there are many interesting examples, but I would I also want to say that in these years, 2006, 2010, there was a boom in interest in, in ground source heat pumps in Spain because of the first incentive schemes at that time. Uh, we saw new incentive schemes split up in Valencia and Catalonia for the first time because they had some data for these systems. And uh, IDAE and other bu public bodies uh, started to support also more clearly this type of systems, uh, particularly after release of the REST Directive 2009, which really uh, set up a, 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 a new starting point for, for the renewable sector and particularly for shallow geothermal heat pumps. So there are, I have to say, already many systems in Spain which are called open loop systems that are different than the systems I have shown here in which the water or from a water body are the, the, the water is directly extracted and the heat is used. So there are many, many tens of megawatts installed in Zaragoza, Valencia, Barcelona about this type of systems, in, uh, including systems that directly exchange the heat with the seawater, like in Valencia, our uh, famous uh, aquarium, which is a five megawatt installations exchanging heat with the sea directly and uh, which is working since long. So there is uh, already much done here in this regard in Spain, but uh, there is a concern also of the quality of this type of installations because also we started to see installations that were not properly commissioned, not properly designed, uh, because uh, as I said before, this thermal and balance with the ground is critical to ensure a long-term sta stable function of this of this type of systems. So uh, the sector started also to, uh, let's say, to cope with this concern, to build up our first UNE a standard in Spain that is UNE it was released in 2013, which is called Closed System, a quality standard for closed loop system in, in Spain, also to ensure that the things, the designs, etc., the, the parameters that, that are gathered from the ground are properly gathered and properly managed inside the design of such system. So we go to the next slide. Uh, these, these early developments, let's say, nowadays have brought 
more recent developments, which are quite more impressive here, like, for instance, next slide, the famous uh, Hospital in San Paolo, which is one, of, is one of the largest systems in Europe with more than 300 boreholes, which is in Barcelona, and, and shows the huge capabilities of this type of system, also for the refurbishment of, of buildings. It's, it is a uh, 150 357 uh, 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 boreholes system in in the in, a, in an hospital with uh, with a very very interesting uh, technical uh, details which I invite you to see if you go to this to this uh, fish here from Idai uh, who, who was also part of this of this uh, uh, design. The next for, very interesting example in Spain of the possibilities of this type of technologies, I would say here is very interesting. This is one of the largest geocooling district heating example in the Barredo mine in geocooling, which in which we can see that a threat was uh, converted into an opportunity. Here, this mine water, which has to be extracted yearly and uh, notably it's 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 so let's say what they call a burden, an eternal burden. You have to extract this water just not to get your your city flooded with this mine water was is used as a as a source for uh, ground source heat pumps with uh, with a very high COPs and uh, it is feeding hospital and, and university and several buildings in in Mieres. This this this. Uh, Business model is, is run by Unosa company, and they are already have started a second system, and they are let's say taking chance of this old mining, abandoned mining, to uh, to really energize and to uh, decarbonize the heating and cooling uh, in in their population. The next example would be here in Valencia, where this is some Titan parameter about this Unosa system. Here in Valencia, we have also a, a nice building here. Our Complex of building is a ground source heat pump, but also there are several air source heat pump, and the Valencian government wanted to have a comparative, uh, large scale comparison between uh, efficiency of ground source and air source here in this in this building, which is the administrational or regional government building in the, in the area of Valencia. There are many many other examples. I just don't want to get into more details here, but just uh, want to give some more general reflections. If we'll just next slide about. What could be, what is the really overall the current situation? What are the opportunities and what can we do more in Spain to, let's say, to boost these possibilities of the ground source sector? So next slide. Here, uh, just to give you a brief overview about what is the installed, the installed uh, capacity here in, in Spain. Uh, as we can see, we have distinguished here in Geoplat about the, the installed in open loop systems, which are, let's say, uh, up to 150 megawatts and the closed lip system I've mentioned before. So I, totally we can estimate a, a capacity installed about between 180 and 270 megawatts. The, one of the problems we have in the sector is the lack of, of, of numbers, of real statistical, uh, uh, really grounded statistical, um, um, let's say, ideas about what is the number of installations, where they are, what is their capacity. This is because According to the Spanish legislation, there are uh, there is not the need in many of these smaller, uh, especially in the smaller system, to really uh, register and and this this system uh, centrally. So there was a there was a huge effort by IDAE and Geoplat to, to try to build up uh, this, this capacity map in in Spain, and we came about this two, twelve about twelve thousand installations in in Spain with an average power of thirty four kilowatts. This is interesting because. The average power in Spain is much larger than in Europe, which is an average power of about 12 to 15 kilowatts. This is because our installations are typically also devoted to heating and cooling, and uh, the economics, let's say, leave, led us to typically larger installations as, as an average. Okay, um, so we have, uh, in compared to the nine million, about nine million of, of air based okay, heat pumps, this is a tiny part of the of the market. So this is one of the, the key takeoff message here is that we are still very small in the market, though really the opportunities are huge in our view to boost and to improve the, the let's say, let's say is very huge capabilities and opportunities for the heat pump in Spain. If we go to the next slide, if we put this in context with Europe, here we can see that in Europe we had already 2.2 million of heat pumps, of ground source heat pumps. Compared to 12,000, really Spain is a very small part of the 
uh, heat pump market in Spain. The Commission and we, uh, the sectors, are discussing now a, a very ambitious plan to to boost uh, ground source space heat pumps in in Europe. They are talking about four millions in 2030 and with an horizon of 10 million in 2050. And we are preparing a strategy with the Commission to, to try to see how we can reach that numbers. But we can see here that in Spain, at, uh, at least in terms of quantitative uh, uh, deployment of this technology, we have a lot of to do still. The technology is there. We have done a lot uh, in the technology, in the area also of certification and so on. But uh, the market is still uh, to be, um, let's say, really uh, uh, worked over. So in the next slide, we can see here what are the opportunities really for the Spanish market in Spain about this technology. And here I have uh, looked for an example built up by Inactiva Arizabalaga, president of Geoplat, and we recently in a, in a meeting in, in, in Asturias showed these numbers. He, they made a throughout study of two, two heat pumps here, air source based and ground source based heat pump for the same dwelling, 100 kilowatt system. And you can see here from the numbers uh, what what are the advantages in some situations of the ground source heat pump? Uh, much larger COP, much lower energy consumption, interesting, much lower heat cap peak capacity. And this is very important because if we are going to massively deploy heat pumps in Spain, we have to look at the grid and we have to look at the capabilities of the grid. And uh, this scenario of having many, many, much more systems operating at the same time would uh, would uh, pose a lot of threats into the energy systems if they if these peak capacities are uh, all, only based on 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 the current technology in air source heat pumps. We have also have a much lower charge of refrigerant, and and so that you can see here in these feeds that you can look at, uh, about more deeply if you have time. That also the the let's say the heat the conditions in which the design is made are very important. So there are two options here. Just following the RITA standard is the second. A row, but with the uni relevant standards, it, there is a, a second, so, a, a different solution, which you can see in the first row. So I will be happy to explain more if you are interested in looking more in detail. But here you can see the advantages that geothermal heat pump could bring with, to the heat pump sector in general in Spain. So just to finish my my presentation for the next the, the last slide. So I would I would hope I could convey this message that ground source can bring a lot to the heat pump sector in Spain. There is a lot of opportunities. There, are, there is a high potential in certain markets because of this high efficiency. And I would also mm, really stress this high integration potential with our technology, including solar technologies. We can alleviate this tension that may arise in the electricity system from a fast deployment of heat pumps, which would only be based on air source. And we have already competitive systems with return of investment types much lower than 10 years in many conditions. But there is, in general, a, a lack of this regulatory environment. Let's say in, in, the, in the part of deep geothermal, this is a barrier, not for the shallow geothermal sector, in which there is no regulatory environment which would which pose a threat for, for our sector. And the last slide is what are the threats and what are the, or what would we need to really let's say, uh, boost this potential I have highlighted here. We are well below our theoretical potential according, let's say, to, to Euro European uh, average. Uh, if you compare to other countries, not only in terms of, of a number of installations, but even in terms of number of units, ground source heat pump units in terms of, uh, compared to the, uh, to the space, to, the, to, our, to our territory or to our number of, of inhabitants, we are well below other countries. So. There's a lot of potential still, and we have very good examples in which this technology works very well and can be seen as demo cases to deploy. There is no technical competence lack or no lack of technical competence in the designers, but there is a general lack of uh, available drillers, for instance, in the sector, which there is a so the uh, the lack is more in the in the in the in the capacity of the sector to really uh, to grow and to escalate all these systems. We must improve awareness and public recognition, specifically with architects and with our stakeholders in the in the building sector, which still do not know this type of possibility of these technologies. And we, we have to train these critical stakeholder groups, and we need to also to have more tailored or let's say uh, better tailored. Uh, support and incentive schemes that take into account this 
higher capex, but the much lower opex due to this higher efficiency. So my last message, my last uh, phrase or sentence here is that we would like to have this alliance with the critical stakeholders such as Fidex, but also the traditional HVAC associations like AFEC or we have today here uh, to work together and to see how this let's say this further opportunity for the heat pump sector in several in certain conditions could, could be really uh, more efficiently deployed in Spain where we have a very complex geology but very rich geology and very good conditions in certain areas to really make a, a lot of this grounds for seed technology. So this was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. And I open for any question that you may. Thank you very much, Javier. Very, very interesting. Um, and I'm sure that the panel discussion will be uh, interesting as well. Um, it is now time to move to our last speaker. David Thomas Sanchez Martinez, full professor in energy engineering at University of Sevilla, where he carries out research on innovative energy systems for combined heat and power production, including energy storage. He has developed large R&D projects funded by European agencies, as well as by national and global companies. He has developed multiple academic appointments internationally and also serves on a number of professional associations globally, such as Knowledge Center on Organic Ranking Cycle Technology, Energy and Turbo Machinery Network, European Microgas Turbine Forum, and ASME's International Gas Turbine Institute. Thank you for being here today, David. Um, you will tell us about thermal energy harvesting in industry, the path to tapping into a large CO2-free European power source beyond 2050. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, just for, for my uh, organization, I think we are running a little bit behind schedule. Is that the case? So I can... Um, yes, but we are we are kind of in time, so okay, great. Thank you, Thank you for yes. that. So indeed, I am uh, I am today I'm, I'm a professor at the University of Seville, even though I'm today speaking on behalf of KCORC, and I uh, presume you are not familiar with KCORC, and, and actually this presentation is a little bit of an outsider today. It's a little bit off topic, and I would like to. Uh, introduce this content as a complementary technology that you might wish to consider in the overall quest for energy efficiency and energy savings. So it is not really an alternative to heat pumps. I'd rather see it as a as a complement to heat pumps. So just let me introduce briefly what KCORC is and what uh, KCORC does. It is a global organization putting together the entire supply chain of organic ranking cycle technology, which, uh, as you may know, it is a thermomechanical energy conversion efficiency, uh, particularly suitable for uh, low temperature energy sources, whichever they might be. It is global because we have members who pretty much all over the world, uh, America and, of course, Europe. This is a, a technology that is strongly rooted in Europe but also Asia and even Africa. Uh, it is comprised of academic members and industrial members as well. And what we do is we try to raise awareness of the existence of this technology. And I will probably in my concluding slide, I will uh, um, summarize the challenges that we uh, face when trying to promote the technology. Uh, we also uh, provide support to the industry. Uh, there is a, a lack at some point in certain applications of uh, standardization and, and uh, uh, technical codes. And we also try to put all these stakeholders together. So we have, let's say, a flagship event, which is uh, uh, an international conference every other year. We uh, recently held the last one uh, here in Seville. And the next one will take place in 2025 in Finland. Uh, it's a conference with around 200, 250 attendees. So um, what I would like to talk about today is uh, making use of thermal energy that is currently not used by the industry in Europe and then focusing uh, on Spain 
uh, using that thermal energy that is currently not used to produce electric power. So at some point, we've been uh, discussing today about producing thermal energy at high temperature, producing thermal energy at low temperature, using different energy sources. Uh, what we are presenting here is, well, let's let's think about converting that into electric power. Now, it might be discussed, and I acknowledge that, whether or not that is renewable, given that this is a renewable energy platform today and a renewable energy venue. And uh, it is true that the <clears throat> thermal energy that is not used may come from fossil fuels, but it is also true that it may also come from uh, renewable energy sources. Uh, what is clear, and there's no dispute about that, is that if you have unused thermal energy and produce additional electric power, that is additional electric power and no additional carbon footprint. And in that regard, we assume that that is or should be considered um, renewable. Um, shall we move to the next slide, please? Excellent. So virtually any industry you can think of will at some point produce, consume, manage thermal energy. It might be the chemical industry that is one of the main contributors to unused uh, thermal energy in Europe. It might be the production of certain materials, in particular steel, if you're familiar with that, producing thermal energy at very, very high temperature, or it can be at a low temperature. Um, it can be uh, also mechanical drives uh, or electrical drives as well, and it can be uh, the management of residues, waste materials and municipal solid waste, for instance, or even treatment of biomass. Now, what you can do with that thermal energy is, well, first of all, let's avoid it for the sake of energy efficiency. And that is actually, we have directives in that direction uh, suggesting and actually asking us to avoid additional use and necessary use of thermal energy. Now, if that is not possible, and please bear avoidance in mind, because I will come back to this, in a few minutes, you can make direct use of it. And that would be just, if you have available thermal energy, let's say at 150 degrees C, just use it to preheat something up to 150, maybe use it in a dryer, or just make direct use of it. Now, if that isn't possible, uh, let's upgrade it. And this is actually probably the most relevant process in this venue. Uh, you can use a heat pump, uh, to elevate the temperature of that thermal energy and then make useful um, use of it. Now, I'm skipping refrigeration, but at some point, you might not be able to do any of this. You might not be able to avoid it. You might not be able to make direct use of it because your process is not really in need of that. You might not be interested in upgrading it, uh, but maybe you might be interested in producing electric power. And you can produce electric power for two reasons, mainly. Uh, as you can imagine, one of them is well, that is an additional uh, product that I might sell, or maybe I can use it just to reduce my electric bill. Uh, whichever the case, it is, it is, let's say, the last step you should think on. And in that process, of course, there will be a certain amount of thermal energy that will eventually be released into the environment. So um, let's move, please, to the next slide. OK, so now an interesting aspect of this is that um, it is distributed all over the place. So given that this is produced by the industry, you can actually find this as an already decentralized or distributed source of energy to produce electric power. And actually, that is what is shown on the map. So you can see that the whole Europe is covered by industries producing this thermal energy and not making full use of it. And the situation, of course, changes from country to country. So in addition to acknowledging that this is well distributed, so this is a step change in the direction of decentralized energy rather than centralized, as is the case today, in particular for electric power generation, you can see that pretty much all industries are contributing to it. So on the uh, right um, top right corner, you can see that even though not equally, not evenly distributed, but all industries, chemical industry, iron steel, not metallic minerals, paper and printing, refineries, many others are contributing to that. Now, situation is not quite the same 
in all countries. And that you can see on the bar chart that you can have below that. Uh, you can see the, uh, there's a lot of energy, first of all. Not all countries are producing the same amount of energy. And then the ratio from the number of industrial sites to the available energy globally, uh, and that is expressed there in terajoules per year, is not the same. Let's focus, for instance, here for the sake of the comparison, let's focus on Italy and France. You can see that Italy has way more industrial sites than France, but they have more or less the same available energy. Now, you can draw two different conclusions from that. The first one would be, well, the number of uh, the, the industrial sites in France are not as efficient as they are in Italy. Well, that, that might be the case. Another conclusion would be, well, the industrial sites in Italy are of a smaller scale. So, so it is not, let's say, a straightforward uh, conclusion to draw, but rather it requires uh, a careful and detailed analysis of the situation in each country. So what I am trying to uh, suggest here is, well, first of all, we have it distributed all over the place. So this I am talking about this technology is applicable pretty much everywhere in Europe and outside Europe, of course. And then secondly, you cannot produce standardized solution. You can have you, you have to tailor your solutions to, um, to the particular case you have in hand. OK, let's move to the next slide, please. So now we understand kind of the global picture that, you know, energy is just the whole category that we have to look into the temperature at which that energy is available. Because if you are familiar with power generation and the fundamental laws of thermodynamics, the um, potential of that energy to be converted into mechanical work or electric power uh, depends on the temperature at which your energy source is. So it is interesting to see this table uh, vertical wise and horizontal wise. Uh, vertical wise is telling you the different industries contributing to this uh, uh, large, huge amount of unused thermal energy. You can see that there are, uh, let's say, uh, main contributors are the chemical and the petrochemical industry, 150 terawatt hour a year. Uh, there are others producing not as much energy, for instance, the iron and steel industry, but certainly at a much higher temperature, even above a thousand degrees C, and that is a lot. There is a lot of potential there to produce electric power. But then, very interestingly, the, you can see a third row from the bottom, you can see others, and that is 263. That is pretty much 30% of the overall amount of unused thermal energy in Europe, which means that you know, there is a very large number of different industries which could benefit from this solution to uh, not only reduce their carbon footprint, but even include, uh, increase uh, their revenue. So let's say um, have a more profitable business. Now, depending on the color, uh, you can see that the darker the cell, the more energy at that temperature level. So uh, above 50% would be uh, dark blue. Now, this I'm saying is just to highlight the fact that there is a lot of energy. Actually, the majority of this unused thermal energy is found between 100 and around 300 degrees C, more or less. So let's move, please, to the next slide. Now, so we now acknowledge that there is a lot of energy. Uh, typically, this energy, I did not mention, but I uh, Sure, you guessed it is uh, is in the form of a uh, of um, a stream of hot gases. That is typically the case. Sometimes at lower temperatures, we are also dealing with uh, liquids. Uh, let's say hot liquids, but that is just only rarely. Most of the times, you have high temperature gases. Now, what you have here is on the vertical axis the temperature at which your available energy is. On the horizontal scale, you have the power output of the electric power output of the power generation system. Now, I uh, draw your attention to the fact that the horizontal scale is logarithmic, so it is not a linear scale. Well, the first interesting aspect here is that you have 
different application spaces, let's call them that way, for different technologies, uh, steam turbines, um, heat pumps, you see them, uh, supercritical carbon dioxide, quite fancy today, and a lot of attention on this technology and also organic ranking cycle. You can see that the yellow region for ORC technology is the largest. And that means that it is able to deal with available thermal energy from 100 degrees C to around 400 degrees C in scales ranging from, let's say, 25 kilowatt, 30 kilowatt to tens of megawatt, let's say 30, 50, even beyond. So that means that it is an extremely flexible technology, even though, of course, you have to tailor it. And maybe you can discuss, I don't want to go very technical, but we might discuss this during the panel session. Now, in terms of technology development and deployment, not only development, but deployment mostly, this is a real challenge in terms of standardization because you're not going to really produce a standardized modular system that you can then sell and production volumes will drive costs down. There is a need to pretty much tailor in certain ranges in terms of scale and temperature for the solution to be deployed to the market. Good, so uh, let's move to the next one. So this is a kind of the same information but now presented in a different way. So this chart here is providing an estimate of the true potential that we have to produce electric power if we were able to harvest all these unused thermal energy. And, and of course, we again have uh, each row for each temperature level. So you can see there uh, more or less the amount of energy that is available. That is what we call the theoretical potential. Now, theoretical potential here means the amount of energy that we would be able to recover from these hot gas streams in stacks uh, using a business as usual um, systems or state of the art technology, or just to name it differently. The technical potential that you see here is the amount of electricity that you would be able to produce if you were to convert the theoretical thermal potential, so let's say second column, into electricity using state of the art technology. So nothing fancy, nothing next generation system, just today's systems. Assuming a certain number of, uh, um, let's say, operating hours a year, you can then convert the technical potential on the third column into the installed capacity that you would need to produce that electricity. So let me now explain it from right to left. If we were to install 19 more or less electric gigawatt capacity using organic ranking cycle systems, and we were to operate them around 8,000 hours every year, and we might discuss later whether or not that is realistic, then you would be able to produce 150 terawatt hour electric every year. And of course, here we are considering, as I said before, state of the art technology, and we are acknowledging the fact that uh, we would install these systems at different sites with different boundary conditions, and you have to take into account that ambient temperature is not the same everywhere in Europe. And, and the previous speaker uh, highlighted that. So it is not the same what you find in Seville to what you find um, up north in Europe. So it is an incredible amount of electricity. So you would have, if you were able to harvest it and use thermal energy, you would have electric power equivalent to what can be produced by 19 nuclear power plants of 1000 megawatt installed capacity each with the very interesting feature that this amount of electric power would be absolutely decentralized and certainly not as in a nuclear power plant in a, in a very large single system far from the users. And of course, this is, uh, it is highlighting in the blue box, a cautious, prudent approach or estimate. We, we are way on the conservative side of the numbers. Can we move to the next slide, please? 
Thank you. No, but that is Europe. What happens in Spain? The situation in Spain is uh, uh, more or less the same at a smaller scale, of course. Uh, you can check the available thermal energy from the industry, let's say a new thermal energy. If you just check the Synergies project, they have an app, they have a database where they load, I think it's close to 2,000 industrial sites in Europe. They have 75 industries logged in Spain. Uh, in all different sectors, so let's say non-metallic, paper and printing, refineries, iron steel, chemicals, so on and so forth. Now, on the chart, what you have is the availability of thermal energy that is currently not used. And we have three different scenarios. Scenario number one would be, OK, let's assume that we can harvest this energy so uh, until we cool the gases down to 25 degrees C. That is level one. If we cool them down to 55, that would be level two. And if we cannot reduce the temperature of the hot gases below 95, because for instance, we would have uh, certain gases condensing and creating problems, um, that would be level three. The dark bar, the dark blue bar, is current situation. So according to what they do today, if we were able to reduce the temperature to 25 degrees C, we would be able to recover 21 terawatt hour thermal every year. Half of it if we were able to reduce um, the temperature of the gases to 55 degrees C. Now, the light blue bar is very interesting because that is the optimum scenario. So that is in a scenario where the industries are avoiding the consumption of excess energy. They are doing as much as possible direct use of that energy to feed the process back. So that would be they are using the maximum amount of or the maximum fraction of the primary energy supply to the site uh, possible. Now, even in that case, you will still be able to harvest a lot of thermal energy. But now let's move on a little bit. Let's go into the future. Oh, sorry, can we go back? That was, a, that was just a formalism. Thank you, Elizabeth. So uh, let's go to 2050 in, in a situation where uh, the grid is fully renewable, fully decarbonized. Fine. Let's say we are not using any more fossil fuels. We have completely electrified the industry, but the industry for the production process is still making use of thermal energy. So you will still have a large fraction of these you have the chart. So this is not what I'm trying to say is that this is not a short term solution. This is a long term solution that goes well beyond 2050 and into the future. Now, this is very much needed on the next slide. Please, Elizabeth. Thank you. When assessing the economics, now what I am sharing with you here is the, the numbers that the uh, OEMs, the manufacturers of ORC systems have provided to the association. And you can uh, see here that there are strong economies of scale. So on the horizontal scale, you have uh, power output, electric power output. And on the vertical scale, you have two different KPIs, internal rate of return and levelized cost of electricity. On the table, you can see that we have capital cost, we have operating cost, and the, the bigger, the uh, cheaper, of course, as it is usually the case with power generation technologies. Now, interestingly, for the payback time, and that is the fourth row, or the row in the middle uh, of the table, you can see that you can have ranges between, depending on your case, of course, five to six years, even below five certain cases. And that is not bad at all, in particular, if you think about the fact that this is a technology that you can use for the next 35, 40 years without many problems. Now, there are a lot of CO2 savings. And of course, I acknowledge that this is for a reference carbon intensity um, for the grid, uh, which on average in Europe is uh, fairly high, I must say. But even if that were not the case in our let's say, evolution towards carbon neutrality, you would still have a lot of CO2 savings in addition to cost-effective electricity. Now, uh, let's move on to the final slide. And uh, there are certain uh, items or messages that I would like to convey here. So 
you can see from my presentation that this is a different way uh, to use thermal energy in industry, uh, which is very much complementary to what you would be able to do with a high temperature heat pump, for instance. Now, out of that synergy and out of that complementarity, we've actually been working for the last year alongside the European Heat Pump Association to carry out joint activities. As a matter of fact, in the um, um, last ORC conference in Seville, Thomas Nowak, the Secretary General of the European Heat Pump Association, delivered one of the keynote speaks and uh, talks. Sorry. Now, that is one thing. We are actually now organizing a workshop, a uh, joint workshop, KCORC, European Heat Pump Association, that will be held in the Netherlands, in Delft, because that is where the, where the headquarters of KCORC is, uh, in, probably in March, late March 2024. Most of the information that I've uh, shared with you today, um, you can find in uh, uh, our white paper uh, with the same name as the talk today. If you go check our website, uh, www.kcorc.org, you will see that there is plenty of information about ORC technology, supply chain, manufacturers, projects, installations, so on and so forth. You can actually register free of charge and have access to even more materials uh, in the private section of the organization, of the website. Now, our challenges today are, well, first of all, I acknowledge the perception uh, of the industry is that if we add this system, maybe the numbers make sense, the economics are of interest, but there is a chance that my reliability um, is reduced. Well, experience is telling us that that is not the case, but I acknowledge that is one of the main barriers when entering, uh, getting in contact with potential end users. Now, we have another challenge. We acknowledge as well that the technology is not very well known. It is perceived as a technology that is currently under development. Actually, if you were to go and check the um, uh, last set of report, the Clean Energy Transition Technologies and Innovations Report of the European Commission, uh, in the first version, ORC was not there. We actually had to get in contact with them to have it incorporated into the document. Unfortunately, we are being forced by regulations to become more and more efficient. Now, that is not really uh, very well understood if you think about the fact that the BREF document, and the reference document for based available technology made available by the Commission for energy efficiency was published in 2009. So that was a long time ago. Uh, the efficiency reported for ORC technology in that document is we don't really know. This is still under development. Well, that is not the case. Let me tell you that we are installing this technology at a pace of about 300 megawatt uh, electric power output a year. In the numbers of around 200 new installations every year. So this is by no means R&D. This is fully commercial. Well, that is why we have KCRC, and that is why we are doing what we are doing. I acknowledge the invitation of the reheat and the, um, the platform, the RHC platform, renewable heating and cooling platform, for the invitation to to be with you today, and of course the European Impact Association. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, so. Uh, I think that all these uh, interventions were really, really interesting. And uh, before moving to the panel discussion, um, I want to stress out some point that uh, all the speakers uh, told about, in particular, the importance of the role of Europe and of uh, public authorities, uh, not only in uh, addressing predictable and right policies, but also uh, in raising awareness and public recognition towards all these, uh, um, these important uh, renewable energy uh, technology. So also, together with that training, as most of the speakers tell, um, training not only to uh, installers, but also to young generation, and the clear info, direction and incentives for stakeholders and consumers are the key for, uh, for, these, uh, for these technologies, as well as the synergies. 
um, also are also the keys for, for all of this. So thank you very much again. And uh, it's the time now to the panel discussion. Um, I already have some uh, some questions that I want to ask the speakers. Um, the first question is for Javier. So what is the legal consideration of heat pumps in Spain and how was the evolution? Thank you. Um, it's for me, the question. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, heat pumps in general or shallow geothermal heat pumps? Uh, the legal consideration of heat pumps uh, in Spain. Well, heat pumps, heat, heat pumps are in accordance to the REST directive considered as a renewable energy source. You, you, you know, uh, the REST directive poses a, a quantifies how much renewable heat is produced by by, by heat pumps. So I, I think this is a very important consideration. And this was a, a game changer because I recall before 2009, there was a, the heat pumps in Spain were regarded as a, as, as a measure for, for efficiency, but not a, a renewable energy production. So this, this has changed. And from any other point of view, heat pumps are like in any other countries of Europe. So it's, it's a uh, it's, it's it's the same, particularly in the in the terms of ground source heat pumps. If we go to, to this area, there must we, we must consider some uh, some specific points there. One is the part of the underground, okay? So the drilling in the underground in Spain, this part of the of the ground source heat pump is not within the so-called mining law, which is different from the so-called deep geothermal, uh, uh, let's say, energy extraction because. The state does not consider heat pumps as extracting any 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 resource from the ground. In that sense, there is no overarching, uh, um, let's say, legal uh, constraints for the deployment of ground source heat pumps, except what could be regional or local provisions, uh, municipal provisions in terms of where you can drill or not, which is still there. The Madrid region has done a lot, and in Basque country they have done a lot based on experience. But there is no uh, legal, let's say, uh, framework for ground source heat pump like in other countries, which specifically addresses this type of, of systems. Thank you. Um, Erika, I have a question for you. Which new solutions we can expect to see in the market that will contribute to widen heat pumps take in the future? Okay, uh, thank you, Elisabeth. Uh, I think it's very much uh, in connection to what I tried to explain. So I think we need to uh, create the, the right frame for the people to go to this technology. Uh, it does not matter any of the options we have been hearing today. Eh? So, but I think we need to, as I said, we need to make easy to first easy to understand why they should do. Then we should create a uh, uh, easy frame if if they need to access subsidies if they can access to the product they should have maybe as i explained easy financial uh, resources to reach and then uh, as i also said if they can perceive they have made a good investment and i think this is very spanish we will explain to everybody i'm the smartest guy so you should follow me so i think that is uh the, the ways I see moving forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ulage, a question for you. Which is the best option to cover existing demands of heating and cooling that is closer to 100% renewable? Okay, thank you, Sveta. Yeah, um, I think there is not one single technology. Here we need to think in global. And I think is the, the, the key word is irrigation. Okay, so heat pumps by themselves are, are very good appliances with very high efficiency. But uh, when we can integrate more renewables in our systems, um, maybe with uh, we have the technology today allows to hybridize uh, heat pumps with solar thermal, but also we can hybridize uh, photovoltaics with solar thermal. So there are in the market we have uh, PVT collectors that can work as a primary source for the water water heat pumps. So I think uh, um, the, the goal is to be more ambitious on the on the on the limits they have established right now and the technology allows to, to go one step uh, forward and and have a better yes better better product better installation in one minute. 
Thank you. Um, Jose Luis, uh, a question for you. Uh, what do you think about the use of hydrogen boilers for heating? And do you think it can hinder the growth of the heat pump market in Spain? Um, to be honest, uh, I think that uh, there is a big hype about using hydrogen uh, for boilers, but for the moment, there is no the infrastructure to deliver hydrogen. Homes. I mean, there are projects, and still there are, in my opinion, it's not so clear the capacity for the production of the hydrogen that would be needed for, for the hydrogen use. And on the other side, I think using hydrogen for heating is using a high exergy product or vector like hydrogen, it's not the best option. So, in my opinion, hydrogen should be used for some specific applications for heating, like where you need high temperature, like in uh, uh, steel industry, but not in, not, in, not in homes. And that's my personal opinion, but I think that the uh, objective fact is that the network is not prepared for this yet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, meanwhile, I can see that uh, Marta already answered to uh, quite a lot of questions in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, David, a last question for you. Um, what are the technology options for thermal energy harvesting and what are the barriers hindering their wider deployment? Well, the, the, the different technologies, I uh, showed them on my slides and uh, um, I would say the, the best option, even though it might look as if, you know, I'm, I'm representing here today KCRC, so um, there is an interest in organic ranking cycle technology, but that is a fairly flexible technology solution. I mean, steam turbines, which are very frequently used in, in CHP applications in the industry, uh, are not easily downscalable, let's say. So um, and then and then for very high temperatures, like for instance the iron and steel industry, uh, which is in need of these type of solutions, I don't really see a clear winner. To be honest, there, there are several technologies that are currently under development, but there's no clear winner today. And winner to me means uh, cost effective. I mean, it might work, uh, terribly expensive. And then the uh, the main barrier would be risk avoidance you know anything that is that is uh, uh, within my premises and there is a risk that i that i lose 0.5 of a percentage uh, in terms of availability and reliability i'm not taking it unless i have no other chance so so i think uh, you know that is kind of a chicken and egg problem because until it is not until you install it and see that it works and there is no threat on reliability that you realize that it was not really uh, reality. That was my more, more, more actually a perception. So we need more units installed. And the more we install, uh, the less they will be feared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we are coming to an end for our webinar. Uh, I really want to thank you all for all this intervention and I'm sure that all the participants uh, um, in this webinar and me as well has uh, more knowledge now of the market uh, uh, of the heat pump market in Spain and of this uh, renewable heating and cooling sector um, of, of Spain. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, don't forget to follow us on uh, on our social media as well as uh, the platform to be updated on every event that uh, will coming up. And uh, stay tuned, of course, for the next roundtables and the next uh, uh, renewable heating and cooling event. Thank you very much again to our speaker and uh, have a nice day. <laughs>